Trevor. Uh, so my name's Jeremy. Uh, you're feel free to call me Jeremy. Uh, if that makes you uncomfortable, you can call me Professor Clark uh, as well. And uh, what I'll do is we'll just go through the course outline at least till IT uh, shows up. So I'll, um, I'm going to do it on my screen even though you can't see it on the screen, but just for the sake of the video. Okay, so the first thing you should do is Google my name, uh, Jeremy Clark, uh, J-E-R-E-M-Y-C-L-A-R-K. And hopefully I'll be one of the top results. Uh, just look for Con Concordia. Uh, if you click on my website, uh, you'll see that there's a tab at the top called Courses. Uh, click on that. Anyone need more time or are you all good? Put your hand up if you need more time. OK. Uh, and uh, the very first course uh, listed on that uh, website is, is this course. Uh, so you can click on that and you'll see the uh, course website. Uh, one thing before we go to the course website for this year is uh, there's course websites from previous years. Uh, so if you want to get a sense of uh, what the material is that will get covered, uh, if you want to look at what the assignments will probably be a little bit different, uh, but if you want to basically like look ahead in the course or, or try and get an overview of what the course is going to look like, uh, you, can, you can take a look at uh, last year. So, uh, technically, I guess you'd have to go back two years. Uh, last year was on Moodle because it wasn't online uh, during the pandemic. And then um, if you go back to 2019, uh, you'll see a, a full website with all the lecture notes and, and everything. Okay, uh, so if you click on uh, the website itself, uh, you'll see, uh, well, first off, you know where we are right now. Uh, you all found it, so that's good. Uh, okay, office hours uh, will have Office hours will be virtual, so they'll be on Thursdays at 1. I won't run them tomorrow. I assume that, that there's not a need to run them tomorrow, but if you do have concerns and you want to talk to me tomorrow, just shoot me an email, uh, and then I'll, uh, I'll set up a time for you. Otherwise, we'll start uh, next Thursday. Uh, the way it will work, I haven't done it this way exactly on Zoom, but I'm told that it works, is there hopefully will be just one link. And it will always be the same link, so you don't have to worry about it. So just Thursdays around 1, you can click on it. And then it will drop you in like a waiting room on Zoom. And then I'll just talk to you basically in order. I'm hoping it preserves some order of like who showed up first. Uh, so it's kind of like waiting in the hall, so it's a little annoying, I know. Uh, but, but anyways, if, if you wait, uh, I'll talk to you one-on-one. -on -one, and then when I'm done with one student, I'll kick them out and then invite someone else in. Um, so that's how that will work. Uh, okay, I'm going to now click on the course outline. Uh, so if you have a device and you want to follow along. If, if you don't have a device, don't worry, I'm recording this. I'll put this lecture on YouTube. One thing I should note, uh, because I am recording this, uh, I assume that you're okay asking me a question and it will be recorded. Uh, if there's any issue with that and you want me to turn off the microphone or something like that, uh, uh, you can do that. We usually have a break about halfway through the class. And I, a lot of you will come up and ask me questions. I'll be sort of sitting here. And uh, at that, I'll edit that out. So I'm going to keep it recording just because it's easier. Uh, but when I put it on YouTube, I'll edit that like inner break, that breakout. So anything you ask me won't be heard by everyone on YouTube. Um, also, I'm sitting down. You'll know that's because I have a microphone here. And if I wander around it, the audio will be poor. And um, the notes will be handwritten as well. So there's not going to be slides. I'm going to write the notes out. You're free to follow along. You can make a copy yourself. Uh, I'll also post a copy of the notes, and you'll have the YouTube video as well of, of me writing them out as well. So uh, all of that will be made available on the website on a lecture-by-lecture -lecture basis. Usually takes me a day or two. Uh, so if it's not up by Friday, uh, then you can bug me about it. But please, like, if it's like Wednesday night at midnight, don't, don't ask like, where the lecture is. It, it takes a bit. I have to edit it, and uh, there's a few uh, components. OK, um, Okay. so the course is obviously on security evaluation methodologies. Uh, that's something that we'll talk about uh, ourselves. And so, so we'll, um, we'll cover that uh, in the second half of, of this lecture. Uh, there's no textbook uh, that's required. Uh, so the, t the exams and the assignments uh, will all be based only on the notes itself. Uh, not necessarily what's written down, but at least what is said in class. So if I say something, I don't write it down. 
Uh, that doesn't mean that it won't be covered if it's not in the written notes, but uh, if it wasn't said in class or written down, uh, then uh, it's not, I'm not going to cover it, okay? Uh, I did put up some textbooks that you might find interesting. Uh, so some of the material for the lecture I drew from those textbooks. Uh, in a lot of cases, I took like an entire book and just boiled it down to one or two lectures. Uh, so it's, it's not required reading uh, that, that you would read like an entire textbook just to cover one lecture itself. But if you are struggling with the course, uh, maybe you don't have the background for it, or you want additional reading, or maybe you're really interested in it, you wanna do a project on it or something like that, uh, then those resources are, are there for you. And I try to pick free ones when available, but, but not all of them are free. Uh, if they're not free, they're not in the bookstore either. You'd have to get them off of Amazon or something like that. Okay, the uh, grading structure uh, for the course will be as follows. So the final exam will be worth 50% of your mark. Uh, there will be no midterm. Uh, the, the project will be worth 30% of your mark, and there will be two assignments. So about a third of the way through the course, you'll get one assignment. About two-thirds of the way, you'll get a second assignment. And then at the end of the course, you'll have your final and you'll have your course project. Uh, so the assignments are worth 10% each or 20% total. Um, the final exam, I'm going to do something a little different. Uh, so usually I schedule it through Concordia. Uh, the problem with that is a lot of people want to travel, especially in the fall term, uh, because there's a, a large break uh, over Christmas and New Year's. Uh, and so and you can't book any tickets until they tell you when your exams are and, and you can't get them changed for any reason. So just to sidestep all of that, we'll actually do the uh, exam in class. So it'll be the very last class of the lecture. Instead of having a lecture, we'll have the final exam. And then your project can be due after that. So you can hand it in. Um, your IT? Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I don't know if you want to look at it. Uh, okay, after that long interlude, does anyone remember what I was saying last? I don't, I don't myself. Um, just the first uh, bullet point of the course description. Okay, thanks. All right. Uh, Okay, the final exam, I, I'll say a few words about. Uh, so, so anyways, we'll have it in class. Project will be due after. I penciled in December 5 as, as a date for the final project. I'm actually not that picky, uh, so if you need more time or something like that. The main thing to, to realize is that uh, I can't give you your mark until the projects, all the projects come in, and then I need some days to, to read them. And keep in mind that if they're all like 10 pages each, then uh, you know, it could add up to like a 400 page book really quickly. Um, so, so uh, yes, I'll, uh, I'll say a few words about the project uh, anyways because, because we can't really do a, a proper lecture anyways, it, I'll, I'll fill the time with that. Um, okay, so the next thing in the course outline is uh, academic integrity. Uh, so if you've been at Concordia before, you, you probably know all of this, uh, but if you're new here, um, so there's a couple things that you're not allowed to do. They should be pretty obvious, but I'll, I'll go through them. Some of them are not so obvious. Uh, so the main thing is obviously you can't cheat on an exam. Uh, so that would consist of looking at somebody beside you. Uh, I'm gonna do what I can, like having different copy versions of the same exam and things like that to, to try and um, prevent that. I'll, I'll randomize where you sit uh, during the final exam. Uh, so you can't, people aren't sitting with their friends and things like that. Um, the second thing is that people will go to the bathroom and look at their phone. Uh, so to mitigate that, I will allow you to bring one sheet of paper and you can write whatever you want on it. So a cheat sheet. So presumably whatever you would be looking up in the bathroom, hopefully is on your sheet, <laughs> sheet anyway, and uh, you don't have to do that. Um, I, I also will say that, that I try to write questions on the exam that are very conceptual. So it's more like, here's a situation, apply what you learn. So it's not the kind of thing you can look up anyway. You can't Google the answer. Uh, you have to like think and apply the concepts of the course to like a new scenario. So that's, that's what I shoot for uh, anyways. Okay, uh, okay, and then the other uh, component, uh, which is a little more subtle, uh, has to do with class projects. Uh, so class projects, you're going to do some research. You're going to be looking at other people's papers. Uh, you're going to look at Wikipedia, whatever, and uh, you need to somehow integrate that into your report, but the academic, uh, the, the um, form of uh, cheating is called plagiarism, uh, which is the idea that you would present those ideas as if they're your own, uh, even though they aren't, right? 
So in general, what you're going to do is you're going to use references. So you're going to cite uh, your material where you got it from. If you read academic papers, uh, it's very common that you would see like sentence citation, sentence citation, like you can't cite too much. Okay, so don't feel like you, you just gotta, like you looked at one report, so you're gonna drop that citation once in your document. It's sort of like if you're getting this idea of this paragraph from this document, then make sure you cite it for, in that paragraph, right? And similarly. The other thing is you can write in a very conversational style. So you don't have to write in a formal style. You can say, you know, Clark et al. looked at this problem and they came up with these five things. Right? And then it's clear from the sentence that you're telling me what they thought. Okay? Uh, so, so you can say that in the actual report itself. So the, the way that you write, you can write in the fact that you got this idea from, from other places. Right? Or you can literally say, like, I, I'm going to show you this framework and you know, I, it, I took it from here, but I tweaked it a bit or whatever the case is. Okay? Um, another thing that, that uh, has been problems in the past uh, is sometimes students will copy and paste a paragraph in. They'll go through and they'll like change the wording, maybe the grammar a bit, but the idea is still the same. It's still literally the same idea. So plagiarism doesn't just apply to like you explicitly take that text. Like obviously you don't want to copy and paste that exact text and pass it off as your own, right? But if you take the text and just do surface level modifications to it, uh, that's still a form of plagiarism, okay? So what you need to do is you need to process the idea and then tell me in your own words what the idea is, uh, as opposed to, to, to trying to repeat uh, the idea from somewhere else. All right, I'll pull up my, the course website so people in the class can follow along. Okay, so anyways, there's a bunch of examples uh, about it. Uh, it is taken very seriously at Concordia. Uh, if, you, uh, if there's an issue, uh, then the first time it goes to like this tribunal, and uh, I sit on the tribunal uh, sometimes, or, or the dean will, will assign a punishment. But the second time, the recommendation is expulsion. Um, so uh, second offenses are, are treated very, very seriously as well. So uh, you don't want uh, to... to uh, have this on your academic record. Um, okay, uh, as I mentioned, these uh, lectures are being recorded, so this requirement that you attend every class is, is not actually true. Uh, you can uh, certainly um, catch up on classes uh, later. Uh, there's a bunch of lists of, of different services that might be uh, useful to you, uh, depending on, on your circumstances. So there's things from the library and resources like that. Um, if you are registered with the Center for Disabilities, uh, you can go through that process. It will alert me, uh, and then we can make any accommodations that you need for your final exam or for your projects or for your assignments and things like that. So that's a very smooth process that you don't have to come directly to me. You can just go to the office, uh, and then they'll, uh, they'll set it up, and uh, I'll follow whatever, whatever they say. Um, yeah, and then there's some other things uh, for mental health, safety, uh, those kinds of things. Uh, so you can take a look at those. Okay, any questions so far? No? Okay. Um, so these are the uh, textbooks um, here uh, that, that uh, will be covered, uh, or sorry, that, that, that some of the material will be drawn from. Uh, you just have a repeat of the actual breakdown. Uh, none of these links are live, so if you click on things, it's not working It's because it's, it's not there yet. Um, so assignment one and assignment two, I'm not sure about. The first assignment will be due October 13th. Uh, you will submit it uh, through EAS. I'll say more about this when I release the assignment, um, but you can just put it in the back of your mind that uh, in engineering, there is a system called EAS, and it's for electronic submission. So you'll submit a PDF. Uh, there won't be any uh, paper copies or anything for any of these deliverables. So your projects and your assignments will all be uh, submitted online. And uh, EAS does require you to register in advance. And you should be able to just log in uh, using your credentials uh, that you have for, for ENCS or engineering or Gina Cody. 
Um, but uh, if you're not in Gina Cody, like if you're in another department or maybe you're at a different university taking this course, uh, then you're not necessarily going to be set up automatically. And so it's important that you uh, reach out uh, just through the support on IITS, the IT support, uh, and, uh, um, and uh, just uh, make sure that they create an account uh, for you so that you can do the submission. Worst case scenario, if it doesn't work, just email to me, like it's, it's not a big deal. Uh, but the TA does mark it from the system and you get your report back through the system and everything. So it does need to go to that system eventually. Uh, but, but if it's like, if there's some technical issue and you can't submit it, you can just email it to me to kind of timestamp uh, that, that you did it. Um, the other thing I do is I usually give uh, slip days uh, for your assignment. So there'll be a deadline and you'll have a total of, uh, I forget how I structured it. Um, let me just look at last year's. So um, basically for one of the two assignments, you're allowed to, to instead of submitting it, um, they're, they're usually due in noon uh, during a class day. Uh, so instead of uh, submitting it, then you can slip until Friday. Uh, but if you do the slip on assignment one, then you can't slip on assignment two. And if you slip on assignment two, you can't slip on assignment one. So I'll explain this whole thing when, when I bring out the assignment itself. But anyways, that's, that's the idea. Okay, uh, the project uh, I will uh, try to discuss. Okay, uh, so I did put the PDF up, but it, I didn't set the permissions right or something like that. Um, so let me uh, pull the project description from last year's website. And uh, the dates will be wrong, but the description itself will be the same. And uh, by, by the end of tonight, I'll, I'll have that link fixed. Okay, uh, so the project uh, will be a written report. Uh, it doesn't require programming, although if you wanna program something, uh, code it, that's perfectly acceptable. Uh, I still need a report though, so you would talk about what you implemented, uh, but most students don't uh, do coding, they just they do research. Um, the subject of the project uh, is either a novel research area related to security evaluation methodology or what's called a systemization of knowledge, so I'll explain uh, what, what these two things are. So the most important thing is the project's wide open. So you can do it on literally anything you want, but this is a security course. Uh, so I wanna know the security aspects of whatever you're doing your project on. And specifically it's about security methodology, which we haven't gone into the content of the course yet, but that's basically like, how do you know it's secure? And what, what are the security goals that you have in mind, right? So I say this laptop is secure, well, what does that mean? That's very vague, like, like exactly what does that mean and how would I be able to assess whether it meets those goals or not meet those goals, okay? So that's what methodology or evaluation is. So what I want is some aspect of not just security but of actual evaluation. So thinking about why something is secure, what are the attacks against it, what are the defenses uh, uh, to those attacks, maybe a comparison between different approaches, uh, those, those kinds of things. Okay, I'll, I'll talk a bit in, in a sec about the difference of the d different two. Okay, so some just basic logistical things. Uh, you can work individually, uh, you can work into larger groups, you can go up to uh, groups of four. Uh, I will warn you that if you're four people, I expect something that's four times as good, okay? Uh, so I will, that will be explicitly evaluated. Uh, and uh, if, it, if you hand me something with four names on it, and it looks like a single student could have done it, or it doesn't look any different than what single students did, then there will be a penalty. It's not like you'll get zero, but, but you won't, you're not gonna get uh, a, a really good, super good mark uh, on that project, okay? So I do weigh the number of people that worked on a project um, uh, into my evaluation of the project, but I do encourage you to work together. Uh, a lot of times uh, you'll have complementary skills, uh, also, like the projects can be funner because you can do like a kind of broader scope uh, and, and do like sort of a bigger thing because you have more than one person working on it. 
Uh, that said, if you're sitting here nervously because you want to do the project by yourself, maybe you don't know your colleagues yet, um, that's perfectly acceptable too. So I've seen really great projects uh, that are a single individual and I've seen great projects that are a group of four. Um, so anyways, that's uh, open to you. To you. Uh, when you submit it, it's just put the four names and student numbers on it and one of you can submit it uh, to EAS and, and then that's good enough. Um, uh, the, the report maximum should be 12 pages, uh, but I stress that this is a maximum, okay? So if you're a group of four, uh, maybe you're writing 12 pages. If you're a single person, you might only be writing six pages or, or eight pages or something like that. Um, so, um, you know, the size really doesn't matter. It's more about the idea that you're communicating uh, in the project and, and the depth uh, of the project itself. Um, uh, it can be in any template, any normal looking template. Okay, nothing weird, uh, but it doesn't matter. It can be whatever, you know, 12 point font. It can be double column, single column, I don't, I don't care. Um, and plagiarism we just talked about. Uh, and so you can review this website as well for some more information, but that's the main, the main thing that's, that's really important uh, to keep in mind. Uh, what I recommend is when you read other papers, you sort of take notes and then you like kind of close that paper. You don't even have it like in visibility uh, range and, and then you just write uh, what your interpretation or your memory uh, of that paper is. Okay, so here's some tips. Okay, so the first thing is uh, some people will take a topic um, like I'll, I'll just pick a topic. Let's say you want to browse the internet anonymously. Okay, this is something we'll cover in the course. Uh, there's some tools that would let you do it. So Tor is one and, and then there, there's others. Now, no one can do that project anymore because I'm using it as my examples. Um, okay, what I don't want is a survey. So what I, I, I don't mind the, the same methodology that you would use in writing a survey. I don't mind you telling me about what people are doing. But in a survey, it's very much like, okay, there's a system called Tor and it does this. And then there's a system called I2P and it does this. And then there's this other system and it does this, right? And then that's the end of the report, right? So it's kind of like three summaries and they're all stapled together, okay? What I want you to do instead is I want you to think about all of the solutions together. And I want you to compare them and to contrast them. So I don't want just, you know, there was this paper and it said this, and then there was this paper that said this, right? I want you to say, okay, there's these two different ideas which one's better? And one of the recurring themes of this course is that if you ask the question, which is better in security, you, there's usually not, never an answer. Okay? It's never the case that A is better than B. Okay? It's always the case that there's trade-offs. A is more secure in these aspects, but B is more secure for these other aspects. Or A is more secure, but it takes twice as long to run. Right? Or A is more secure, but you have to have a PhD in order to run the software because it's super complicated. Okay, uh, so there's always these trade-offs uh, that are involved, and I'll show you some techniques for how to express uh, uh, how you evaluate uh, these different trade-offs. But anyways, the other thing I'd like you to do is think critically as well. So a lot of times, especially as younger students, younger researchers, uh, early in your sort of research careers, um, it's hard to be critical of a paper, right? So you read a paper and you think, well, this is a paper, it's published, these people, you know, whatever, they're smarter than me or whatever. Uh, and so whatever they say is right. If they say it's fast, it's fast, right? But papers are, they're kind of like sales pitches, right? Like academics are sort of salespeople and they're trying to pitch you on the idea of the paper and they're going to tell you all the benefits of it and they're going to kind of sweep all the weaknesses under the carpet sometimes, unfortunately, okay? And so your job is to find those weaknesses and you know, maybe it's buried in a paragraph on page eight, right? But you want to pull that out and say, actually, this is very critical. Like, this system will never work in practice because of this, right? Or whatever the case may be, okay? So you can be critical of the research and don't just believe everything uh, that you read. Uh, the other thing is that uh, often uh, research follows uh, sort of generation. So like someone has an idea first, then someone writes a new idea, and then someone, a third person writes a new idea, okay? Now, the first person to write the idea, they obviously, they don't know the future, so they don't know what the third solution is. So they themselves can't tell you why they're better than that third solution. The third solution 
knows about the second and the first solution, so they'll tell you why they're better than the first solution. But the first solution person, they can't speak anymore. I mean, maybe they give a presentation or something like that later, okay? So your job is also to fill in those gaps as well, okay? So when you look at two systems uh, and you compare them, uh, you have to think about what are the things that the first person would have said if they knew about what the second and third person were doing, uh, but they didn't just because of, of timing. Um, Okay, so anyway, so this is sort of this idea of systemizing knowledge. So you compare it, you pull it together, you put it side by side, uh, you try and evaluate it consistently uh, across all of the different ideas, okay? Is that relatively clear? Any questions about that? Okay. Um, okay, what about topics? Um, so I students sometimes ask for a list of, of topics. I pasted actually a couple a little bit later but, but anyways, I'll, I'll show them to you in a second. Um, the good thing is, uh, a good approach to do is, this is supposed to be a research uh, project, and so you wanna look at research papers. And research actually comes out of lots of different sources. So a lot of companies do research and they have really good blogs, uh, blog posts and things like that. And while I'm on that topic, um, you, if you do a cutting edge uh, like kind of topic, a lot of your resources might be like blog posts and things like that as opposed to like academic paper. Sometimes it takes you know, a year or two for a good academic paper to come out on a topic. That's perfectly acceptable, okay? Uh, so you can cite, uh, you can cite any, I, like I write papers myself where I'm citing blog posts a lot, okay? Uh, the important thing though is that anyone can write a blog post. It's not peer reviewed uh, and so you need to basically vet it and believe it, right? Like you have to, tell me a reason why I should believe that that's the result, okay? Sometimes it's written by like people at Google or Microsoft or something like that and like they obviously have the credentials to, talk, to know what they're talking about. Sometimes it's just the content itself, right? The content speaks for itself. Um, so uh, anyways, feel free to cite informal resources like that. Uh, you don't have to stick strictly to academic papers. Uh, another approach, another thing too is uh, if you look for academic papers, uh, one uh, really good resource is Google Scholar, uh, which you've probably seen. Uh, the problem with Google Scholar is it finds all kinds of research papers. Like, just because something's published, it doesn't mean it's good, okay? So there's a lot of conferences that uh, you basically can pay uh, to publish there, and, uh, there's, there's, uh, and you can publish junk, right? Sometimes people plagiarize another paper and they submit it and it gets published somewhere, okay? Uh, so these kinds of things happen. And Google Scholar is very, like, it finds everything, right? If it's on the internet, looks like a paper, it's going to scrape it, and it's going to put it in the results, okay? So you're going to find all sorts of uh, low-quality research mixed in with high-quality research, okay? So that's one thing to keep in mind, uh, is that, that not all your results are going to be high-quality. Uh, one thing you can look at, it's not perfect by any means, you can look at the number of citations. So if you see something that's cited 100 times, that's a good paper, like, I don't care what anyone says, that's a good paper. Um, if you see it cited once, it doesn't mean it's a bad paper, okay? It could be a paper that's only a year old, no one cited it, or maybe it's on a really narrow, esoteric topic. But if it's on a, like a really general topic, and you would think that there would be a ton of citations, and it's five years old, and there's only two or something like that, that could be an indication that it's not high quality, okay? So that's not a strict rule, uh, but it's just to get you thinking about, uh, critically, about the sources uh, that you use. Okay, uh, okay, back to topics. Um, so uh, instead of using Google Scholar, what you can also do is you can go to known venues of high quality research. So in the academic community, there's four conferences uh, that are, are the best for the big four uh, conferences, so they're listed there. And they have lots of workshops and there's tons of good conferences beside these four, okay? Uh, but these four would be a place to start. So what you could do is you could go to the proceedings of whatever, IEEE Symposium on Security and Privacy. You can look at 2021 or 2020. Just go through the titles, okay? Don't, you're not gonna read all the papers. There's you know, over 100 papers. Uh, but just go through the titles and, and maybe you see something uh, that sparks your interest, right? Someone's looking at, I don't know, smart TVs and you're like, oh, that's really cool. Or they're looking at the security of automobiles or I don't know, whatever, Bitcoin, you know, whatever. Uh, so you could go there and it could spark an idea uh, uh, for a topic. Um, and then if you find a paper uh, that you're sort of interested in, then you can read the abstract, which is like a summary of the paper. 
And maybe you're reading five abstracts, not all of them. And then at the end of reading five, you find the one paper that you really like. Uh, and then you read that paper. And then every paper also has a related work section in it. So usually, sometimes people are the very first people to work on a certain area. Uh, but a lot of times, they're the third or fourth. Uh, and so they're going to explain what other people have done up until then. So related work is good for two reasons. One is it can help find other papers. Okay. Uh, so you can find other papers. Uh, the second reason is that you can read a summary of an existing paper, right? So another trick you can do with Google Scholar is, let's say you have a paper and you really like it. Uh, what you can do is you can see what paper cited it, right? And so it'll show you a list. It'll say, oh, this paper's been cited 20 times, and here's the 20 papers that cited it. Then you can go read those papers, and sometimes they, it's just a throwaway citation. Right? They're just like, oh, this topic has been studied, and then they have like five citations. But sometimes they have a paragraph about what that paper is about. Sometimes they have a half a page because it's like really relevant to it. Uh, sometimes those papers are pointing out the weaknesses uh, that the authors themselves don't really present uh, fully. Okay, so, so by building this sort of graph of, of through citations, uh, you can also like learn different people's perspectives on, on, on work. Uh, okay, uh, in terms of the logistics of the project, you don't have to tell me your topic, you don't have to clear it with me, uh, you don't have to tell me your teams or anything like that, okay? Completely hands off on December 5th or whatever it is, I expect a report in EAS and that's it, okay? Uh, that said, you can come and talk to me, so I am here to help. Uh, if you want ideas or if you want to bounce something off of me, uh, like in terms of ideas and things like that, you can ask me during the break, after class, uh, during office hours are all good times. Um, the other thing is uh, sometimes people want me to read drafts. I can't do that. Uh, if I promise to read drafts, then I'll end up reading drafts for everyone, and it's just too much time. So I'll put a, like, a time bucket of like two minutes. And so if you want to show me something, I'll you know, start a two-minute timer, and I'll look at as much of it as I can for two minutes. And usually just by skimming the, the, the like, section headers and things like that, I can get a good sense of, of, of what the paper's about. Um, so uh, anyway, so, so don't look to me to like, I'm not, you're, I'm not gonna read a draft of your paper and then, and then give you feedback. Um, but I will help you like steer uh, the topic of the paper and things like that. Okay, um, projects that are bad in past years, uh, they usually pick some topic. Uh, one, one bad thing to do is they pick something that's way too broad. Right, so like they talk about Android versus iPhone, and like you can't do justice to that topic in 12 pages, right? Like it's just not. It, there's too many variables. Okay, you can drill down, so you can talk about what are the permission capabilities of Android versus the permission capabilities of the iPhone, right, or something like that. So you can find a really really narrow topic and and address it, but you're not going to do all of iPhone versus all of Android, okay? Uh, so when you start thinking of topics, one thing you want to do is try and narrow it down. And generally, the narrower the topic, the better the report is. Okay, so it's much better to do a really deep dive on one specific thing as opposed to like try and you know do a, a broad uh, a broad study of, of a whole bunch of different things. Um, yeah, and then the other thing is that uh, is that sort of survey approach of just sort of like this person did this, and then this person did this, and then this person did this, and then maybe a paragraph at the end saying conclusions uh, from all of that. Okay, so I really want side by side comparison. I want you to take different results and and think about all of them across the board uh, in in terms of of uh, what they're presenting. Um, one trick that works well. You don't have to do this. Uh, but it, it's a good way to like start thinking about it. What's a good topic? Is phrase your topic title as a question, right? So you know, like, um, well, in terms of Android permissions or something like that, it, it could be like, uh, uh, you know, which which operating system, you know, iOS or Android leads to fewer dangerous errors made by users in doing permissions or something. That, that's really weird and, and a long title. But, but anyways, that, that's the idea of a question uh, that, that you could ask, right? Or uh, which anonymous browsing uh, tool has the best usability uh, for users? Or which one provides the, the strongest security guarantees? Or which one is resistant to quantum computing? I don't know. Um, but, but anyway, so if you, if you phrase it as a question, then it also becomes really easy because another problem is what do you talk about, 
right? So you have your topic. Uh, what, what exactly is in scope for your project and what's out of scope for your project? And if it's a question, it's like, well, is this ha helping to answer the question, right? Like, do I have to do a deep dive on this topic? And if it's not answering the question, then the answer is no, right? So it becomes, it becomes a lot easier to figure out, like, like you, only, you only write what you need to answer the question, and that's it. Um, so anyway, so th these are just tips. Uh, you don't have to follow them exactly, but uh, they might help. Um, OK, so if you go to like one conference, like say Usenix Security, uh, they do issue a call for papers. And they try their best to write down a bunch of topics that they would accept papers on, okay? But the truth is they'll accept, and I will accept for my project, anything that has to do with security. And probably the most interesting projects wouldn't fit this list. So this is more like, these are kind of like hot research areas or research areas where they've seen uh, a lot of things. But if you really want to stare at a list of, of topics, uh, then you can take a look at this list and it will at least get you started on, on some of the different things uh, that you can look at. Um, one of the, uh, the, the thing I would point out though is that uh, these tend to be very broad, okay? So some of them are like deeply technical topics like system security of operating systems. Some of them are more mathematical like cryptography, uh, those kinds of things. Um, some of them are about humans, right? Human computer interaction, security, privacy. Um, some of them, I don't know if there's a specific one, but some of them might be more even on policy or, or those uh, kinds of things. Um, some of them look at specific use cases, right? So at the very end, uh, you can see uh, security and in critical infrastructures, voting, healthcare, uh, sensors, uh, commerce, uh, those, those kinds of things. So, um, yeah. Okay, the, the grading will be uh, pretty simple. It'll just be out of 10. You can get half marks and, and things like that. Um, uh, but basically, what I want is the first thing I'm looking at is scope. So uh, a good project uh, should have a clearly defined scope. Uh, so what's on topic for the project and what's off topic, okay? So you're not telling me a whole bunch of stuff that's not like really relevant to the actual central uh, theme of, of your project. Um, there should be logic uh, in terms of uh, how you flow through the material. So it's just not just like this person said this, this person said this, like there's some logic uh, to, to how it flows. Uh, it should be complete and comprehensive. Uh, so if you miss like an important thing, uh, then, then there might be a deduction for that. Um, yeah, and, and all the material that's, that's presented, there should be a reason why it's there, right? It shouldn't just be there for the sake of, of, of being there. Um, and then I just repeat the idea that, that if you phrase it as a question, it, it sometimes helps. Uh, interpretation is sort of how you present uh, the material. So for me, it's like your students, so I'm evaluating you. And so it's like, did they actually understand it, right? Like I can tell from, or I try to tell from the writing, like do they understand it? Are they just repeating things? You know, like they read that the five bullet points are this, and so they're telling me the five bullet points are this, but they don't really demonstrate an actual understanding of it. Um, so you don't want to just repeat what other documents say. You want to try and say it in your own words or have your own way of presenting it or uh, even criticize how they present it or say like, well, they present it this way, but I, I think it's better to understand it this way. Uh, whatever you can do to make it clear to me uh, that you understand uh, what you're talking about. Uh, and then the, the amount of work uh, that goes into the project as well. So this is a term project. You're supposed to, you know, you're not supposed to start writing this three days before, right? So you have your final exam and then it's due in three days and, and you start the day after the final exam. Uh, that You shouldn't be doing that. Everyone's nodding now, but the semester is going to get busy, right? Um, and, and at the end of the semester, you have three or four courses and they all have final projects and they all have final exams, right? Uh, so the amount of time uh, that you have at the very end uh, is hard. So I will say this, you'll nod in agreement, you should start early, uh, but it really is true. Uh, you, should, you should start uh, the project as early as you can. Um, and then uh, technical detail, I expect, you know, it's a graduate level course in security, and so I want something that, that shows uh, some technical understanding uh, of, of whatever your topic is. So it's hard to give specifics because different topics have different uh, kinds of things, but you know, I expect something that, that would be uh, from someone that's, that's doing a, a master's or a PhD in uh, security. 
Okay, uh, questions about the project? Or questions about anything? Going once, twice, sold, okay. All right. Um, okay, so this is where I normally transition into the course itself. Uh, unfortunately, because the projector isn't working, don't get too excited. I'm not, I am going to do, I'm going to fill the time. Um, but uh, because the projector is not working, I'm not going to do what I normally do. So what I have in my mind is, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to pull up last year's notes. And instead of me writing out fresh notes, uh, we'll just look at them like as if they're slides. And it will kind of suck because the, I, it, I try to make it interactive. So like what I write down is actually what you're telling me. So I'll try not to show you too much of the slides uh, at first. Uh, I'll try to tease you a bit and, and we'll try to figure out what we would say and then we can look at what the students in 2019 did and see who's better. Uh, but anyways, why don't we uh, take our break? It's a little early, but why don't we just chill for 10 minutes? Uh, you can get a drink or whatever and uh, give me time to set this all up uh, and then come back and, and we'll uh, start the lecture. So as I mentioned, this course is called Security Evaluation Methodologies. And so what does that actually mean? So the main idea of this course is, let's say you graduate, you get a job, uh, hopefully you're in security now that you're doing a specialization in security. Uh, so you show up on the first day of your job and you're now the security person. And so your new boss hands you something and says, is it secure or not? Okay. Uh, and so how would you go about evaluating uh, whether that is actually secure or not? Okay, so that's the sort of high level promise of the course. Now the challenge, as we'll see, is there's really no way for you to uh, take some recipe that you follow uh, and you're just going to execute these five steps and then you'll say, yes, that's secure, no, that's not secure, okay? Uh, so security isn't that clean uh, in terms of how you evaluate it. Yeah? Is it the same as penetration testing? Uh, so let's use that as an example. So penetration testing is a methodology. So this course is, is about methodologies in general. So one methodology might be pen testing, right? So pen testing is, if you don't know, it's in terms of network security. Uh, so you have a server, you have known vulnerabilities, uh, you run them, uh, the known vulnerabilities basically against the server. You try and see uh, whether any of them uh, lead to an exploit uh, of the server. Yeah. But there is many guidelines like OWASP and famous like MITRE or something, so they can guide you at some, at some, in some way to get, uh, conduct a evaluation of your, let's say, web application or your network security. So uh, we can consider those as an option? Yes, yeah. Follow? Okay, so the comment is that there, there are existing methodologies, so like Web3 or whatever will put out uh, different uh, um, uh, guidelines that uh, that you can use and they have sort of checklists of things uh, they might have some automated tools uh, that let you uh, test uh, whether your software like your website in this case is, is vulnerable to certain known vulnerabilities you know cross-site scripting or whatever um, and so yeah so that that is a methodology as well so what was the thought process that went into writing down what those rules are what the recommendations are um, that, that's sort of the topic of this course. So like, how, how is it that they ended up with these lists of guidelines? Yeah. Okay, now one of the challenging aspects of security, and one of the reasons that, that, that for example, these uh, recipes, they work great if you have a website, right? But what if you don't have a website? What if you have a piece of hardware, like a chip, right? Then what are you going to do, right? So then maybe there is some methodology for hardware as well. Okay, but essentially you need for everything that you might think of what's the security of this thing, you need some methodology that matches it, okay? And there's not gonna be a general recipe that works for everything, right? So the same recipe that works for pen testing a server isn't gonna work for looking at a hardware-based chip trying to decide whether it can be reverse engineered, for example, okay? So one of the main challenges of this course as the course almost over promises, right? It says you're going to walk out and be able to evaluate the security of everything. That's absolutely not the case, okay? You really have to be a domain expert in what you're evaluating, unfortunately, to really do a good job of trying to decide whether it's secure or not, okay? But what we will do is we will try to teach you some general techniques uh, that you can use to at least get started. Uh, and we'll do some deep dives on some different protocols. So 
I'll, I'll kind of make you experts in specific areas in order to show how an expert would use a certain methodology. Um, so for example, we'll spend a lot of time on something called HTTPS. This course has nothing to do with it. Like I could have picked any example, but it's just a nice example. And we'll spend like three weeks on looking at this protocol and not because I want you to learn about the protocol, but because I want you to see the technique that's involved called an attack tree. And I, I want you to really see it on a real example, not like some trivial example, but like on something that, that requires a lot of domain knowledge. Um, so, so anyways. Um, okay, so the challenge, uh, the first challenge, I guess, of methodologies is that there's too many areas of security, right? So what are some of the areas of security? So we talked about, I mentioned hardware, websites was mentioned, uh, servers. Uh, so those are three. Uh, is there any others that people can think of? Just shout out whatever you think. Okay, operating systems. So let's let's put software kind of together. So you have like web applications, phones, databases, operating systems, servers. Uh, networking could be its own thing. So that involves servers, but then you have network protocols and whether you know networks are secure in terms of integrity and uh, reliability and whether messages are confidential if they're supposed to be confidential, that kind of thing. Uh, hardware could include IOTs, like chips, uh, cars, I don't know, uh, that kind of thing. What else? Okay, wireless devices would fit as well. So uh, that would fit under hardware maybe. Okay, great. So more classical security thing. So like this room, right? There's locks on this room. Uh, there's some lock that stops everyone from using the projector. Uh, there's some software that stops me from projecting my screen. Uh, uh, so yeah, so it's like physical access. Uh, so that's another important aspect of security. And so if you go to security conferences, it's not all talks about servers, like sometimes you are picking locks, right? Or like taking a lock picking course or, or something like that. Military stuff? Yeah, okay, yeah, so that, that falls under it as well. So you can think like national security, uh, national defense, government level security. Sure, sure, sure. So that's like telecom, but like large scale, expensive projects, right? And so, yeah, there's a lot of security that go into uh, like really expensive stuff, like sending rockets into space or doing satellites and things like that as well. Uh, airplanes. Um, you know, physical, uh, like large, you know, uh, uh, large, large things like that. And then you have a lot of re reliability guarantees as well, right? So you don't want the security system of the airplane to interfere uh, with its ability to safely uh, fly people. Uh, and so, yeah, so that would be another example. Anyone have any other ideas? Say again. Data security. Okay, so data, so you can think more at the informational level. Right, so forget about whether it's on a software or on hardware or going across a network. What about like the data itself, right? So things like encryption uh, could come into play or signing data for integrity. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So yeah, so data privacy. Um, so you can think of, uh, yeah, what's what data is being collected about you in databases? Um, what, uh, what can be inferred? Uh, from that data, who's that data shared with? Um, you know, those those are all aspects as well. Okay. Uh, do you say elections? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So yeah, so there are uh, real use cases. So I actually did a lot of work on voting systems. That was one of my main research areas. Uh, and so yeah, there's a lot of different uses. So you might think of commerce or finance. What's the security of that? What about voting? There's a voting thing coming out. What about the vaccine passport, right? Like that's coming out. What's the security uh, with it? What's the privacy aspect? I may make you do assignment one on that, but I haven't, I haven't fully thought out the assignment. Um, but yeah, yeah, uh, that's, that's another aspect. Anything else? Traffic security, whatever, like if you do this, there's encryption, instead of just encryption, like uh, let's say AES or GES or... Okay, okay, yeah. So, so uh, it, going back to encryption, that's at the data level, but Things like traffic, also the cars themselves. Sometimes we call this cyber physical. Uh, so there's software, but, but it actually makes changes in the physical world. Could be electricity plant, uh, so things are controlled. Could be a nuclear fusion uh, plant or something like that. Um, yep. Finance, avoiding double spending attacks. Sure. 
Yeah, so that's another research area of, of mine personally, but that's another use case. Uh, so there's lots in, in terms of uh, finance. Yeah, exactly. Double spending, uh, making sure that payments are, uh, when they're made, they're final, making sure that I can't lie about the payments I made in the past. Uh, those, those are properties. Uh, we'll, we'll look at that uh, to some extent in this course. Digital currencies? Say again? Digital currencies. Digital currencies, yeah, so that would fall under the same umbrella. Yeah, cyber, or, uh, uh, cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin, blockchain, Ethereum. If you want to learn about that, uh, take my course next term. Uh, so I'll teach INSC 6630, and it will be on blockchain technology, Bitcoin. Whoops. Sometimes I get excited and I <laughs> knock my microphone over, or I like. Yeah. Okay, so I've heard, actually, I've heard all of the things I have in the notes. I actually turned the screen off purposely so you wouldn't cheat. Whoops. And so these are, you've said all of the things except for one. Okay, so it's still not on the screen, uh, the, the one that you didn't say. Uh, there's one other aspect, and this is actually something that we'll focus a, a fair bit on uh, in this course because it's not really covered very well in the other courses that you'll, you'll take. So uh, assuming that you're in the ISS program, you're going, to take, you're going to learn about software security and operating system security. You're going to take a whole course on network security. Uh, you're going to take a whole course on cryptography. Uh, so there's a lot of aspects uh, that you're going to learn. Uh, but one thing uh, that's Right now, it's actually probably the kind of hottest area or the most important area is, say again? No, no. Anyone else? Okay, perfect. So people, right? Uh, so humans, right? Uh, so humans are, are critical uh, to the system. So if a human doesn't do uh, what they're supposed to in terms of security, then that presents a vulnerability. So you might write the best security software. It might have the best security you know, properties and provisions. Uh, but if the human can't use it, right, uh, then, then you're in trouble, right? Then, then you, you might as well not have that security software at all, right? If, if the human user can't use it, uh, they make mistakes using it, they turn it off because it's annoying or because it slows them down, uh, then it's, it's basically as good as not having, uh, not having that security at all. Uh, social engineering is another thing. So if you want access, say you want to break into a server room, you can do it digitally, you can try some sort of network attack, or you could just show up dressed in the uniform of an IT person and ask for access because you're there to repair the server and, and, and do whatever you want. Um, and so, yeah, so social engineering we'll spend a lot of time on, not a lot, but, but it will be a focus. We'll spend like one or two lectures on it. And usability uh, and how you evaluate whether systems are usable or not uh, is another topic that we'll spend uh, one or two lectures on. Okay, so the, uh, the, the next thing is, uh, here's a, a sort of a set of points for why this course is hard to teach, I guess you could say. Um, so the first thing is that evaluation itself is hard uh, because there's not a single methodology that's going to work for all of these things, right? So if your boss at your new job comes to you and says, we have this procedure for like how employees can enter the building, right? And we wanna make sure there aren't loopholes uh, in that procedure. Right? You can't do pen testing to do that. Actually, pen testing is almost like close enough. It's kind of the same methodology. But you can't do cryptographic attacks, right? Or you're not going to do a crypto proof uh, that, 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 that these procedures are done correctly. Okay? Uh, yeah, and if you look at hardware, it's going to be different than software. And it's really in these like sort of softer areas like policies and people and procedures and things like that where security actually gets not well defined. So the, almost the more technical it is, the better like the security principles are and the better evaluation methodologies we have. Um, but when you have these sort of softer areas of security, uh, that's where you start to see gaps uh, in terms of, of how well that uh, we can do. So I'm going to try and focus in this course on those sort of gap areas myself. OK, uh, the second point is that uh, you can't, if you don't know anything about digital currencies, you might know a lot about security. You've taken lots of courses and you've taken this course and so you know about security evaluation methodologies, but you don't know anything about digital currencies, you're not gonna sit and three days later tell me whether a new digital currency is secure or not, right? Like there's no escaping the fact that 
you need to have domain knowledge of what you're evaluating, right? So normally you would have to like understand what's going on. Like security is a secondary thought. The first thing is just like, how does this work? What's the functionality of this? How does it actually work? And then once you understand the functionality, <coughs> excuse me, uh, then you can start uh, thinking about its security. Sorry, it's not COVID, I don't think. I just uh, <laughs> didn't bring water, uh, which I normally do. But um, OK, so, so having some in-depth knowledge uh, makes it hard as well. OK, the final thing is uh, kind of the most philosophical point I guess we'll make in the whole course. Um, but it's, I'll just state it. So security is necessary, but not sufficient. So what does this mean? It means that you will never be able to say that something is secure, OK? All you can say at the end of the day is, I know about all of these attacks, and it's secure against these attacks, OK? So there, you know, take the pen testing example. It's a great example, right? There's, here's a 1,000 things that people have tried in before. I tried them all on this, and it doesn't work. Right? So it's secure against this, against that history of past thoughts. Does that mean that no one will come up with a brand new attack that no one's thought of and break your system? Doesn't mean that, right? So security is kind of a negative concept as opposed to a positive concept. It, it tells you what doesn't happen. It, it doesn't, if you do this attack, it doesn't break. If you do this attack, it doesn't break. But it can't tell you, it, you can't prove that it will do some positive thing for you, like it will always protect this data or it will always uh, you know, be reliable or, or whatever uh, the positive thing is uh, that you want to say about it, OK? So it's really hard to, uh, so anyways, the good news about this is if you're in the security field, you'll never be out of a job uh, because there's always going to be new attacks. People will think of new things. Uh, then you have to rerun all of your analysis with the new information and you have to look at all the systems that you've looked at before with like this fresh new attack uh, in place. And yeah, attacks get better over time is, is what we observe. And uh, it, you, know, you know, people sometimes have theoretical attacks or there's like a break, but it's not that serious. Can't do anything interesting with it. But give it two, three years and people will combine it with other attacks or uh, people will find ways to make it more efficient. And then all of a sudden it becomes a, an important attack that everyone has to consider. Um, so yeah, so security is is sort of, uh, your, your job's never finished uh, when, when you deal with security. Okay, any questions so far on any of this or comments? This can be interactive too, don't feel that you have to uh, only ask questions to, to clarify what you've heard. Okay, so what we'll do at the start of the course is the first couple of lectures, I'm going to show you three really high level evaluation methodologies. Okay, so high level that they're almost not useful. Okay, <laughs> but if you have it combined with domain knowledge of what you're talking about, it can be useful. You can also think of it as a start. It's a way you need to start somewhere. And so it gives you, um, it gives you, yeah, basically a, a starting point. You can think of it as brainstorming exercise. Uh, it gives you something to do on day one. So day one, your, your employer gives you something and says, is it secure? You can say, well, maybe I could use Stride or an attack tree or something like that. And it gives you something to do anyways until you uh, figure out exactly what, how you want to evaluate it. Um, so the three really high level of, uh, methodologies, uh, the one's called Stride. Stride is a recipe. Uh, it basically says, here's six things uh, that, that are often uh, considered when you consider uh, attacks against systems, they usually fall in one of six categories. Uh, so these are the six categories, and why don't you think about whether these categories apply uh, to whatever it is that you're looking at, okay? Um, an evaluation framework is used strictly for comparing multiple solutions. So someone might hand you one thing and say, is it secure? Then stride is, is appropriate. Someone might hand you two things and say, which one's more secure? Okay, so that's a slightly different question. Right? And so you need a comparative uh, framework as opposed to, to just evaluating a single thing. So the evaluation framework is, is what we'll look at for comparing different alternatives uh, to, to trying to solve the same problem. Uh, and then attack tree is, is like stride. Maybe I should order it differently, but I do attract t trees at the end because I, I spend more time on them. Uh, but they're kind of like stride in the sense that they, they let you start thinking about how you're going to attack a system. 
uh, and uh, it's, uh, it's a methodology like stride that you apply to a single solution. So you have one thing that you're looking at and you're thinking about how you're going to break it. Okay, so stride itself, like I say, it's, it's, uh, um, it's basically the six major categories that attacks fall into. Um, there was an earlier classification called CIA. You still see it in some security courses. CIA stands for confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Uh, and so Stride basically says, uh, we'll keep those three. They're good, uh, but they're not good enough. We need another three. Uh, and so it introduces three on top of that. And it changes the, the names of them confusingly so, so that they're no longer CIA. They're something else you'll see in a second. Uh, what they are, but uh, those those three map onto three of the six Stride properties, and then there's three extras. Uh, Stride comes from Microsoft Research, uh, and so there's a textbook as well. It's one of the uh, recommended readings, but not something that you have to read uh, for this course. You just have to understand the material in the lecture itself. But if you looked at that, you would see that oh yeah, there's like a hundred page textbook on just Stride, uh, and and it covers attack trees and a few other things. It's a, it's actually a really nice book. Um, but, but, but anyway, so this is like a serious uh, thing. It's not just something that someone came up with in the shower and then put on a blog post or something like that. Um, okay, so without further ado, uh, this is Stride itself. So we have uh, spoofing. Whoops. Okay, spoofing, tampering, repudiation, information disclosure, denial of service, and elevation of privilege. Sometimes I, I always call it escalation of privilege. They're, they're kind of interchangeable terms. Um, okay, so let's go through these and, and try to understand uh, what each of them are. So the first thing that Stride does that's a little different than CIA is CIA tells you the positive property. So you want confidentiality. You want your messages to be secure. Stride is from the perspective of the attacker. So if Confidentiality is the property you want. What's the attack? The attack is that you break confidentiality. So in this case, they call it information disclosure. So information disclosure is the attack, and then confidentiality is the property that's being breached. So these six ones are, are all phrased in terms of the attack itself. Uh, you can see that tampering corresponds to integrity in CIA. Uh, information disclosure uh, corresponds to confidentiality in CIA and denial of service corresponds to availability. And then there's three spoofing, repudiation, and escalation of privilege that are not um, part of the original CIA. Okay, so let's uh, go through them one by one. So spoofing is um, impersonating something or someone else, okay? So you say that you're somebody else. So think of the social engineering example. So you show up at a company, you're dressed like an IT worker, but you're not actually an IT worker and you want access to it, okay? So that's a form of spoofing attack. Now, spoofing is easy to think in terms of humans, but it can also be in terms of uh, digital things as well, right? It could be a computer, I spoof your MAC address or I spoof your IP address. Uh, not, I phrase that wrong, like I would spoof my own uh, IP address. Uh, maybe, uh, so for example, in Concordia, if I want to plug into the networks, uh, Every network fork has a MAC address and it only talks to that MAC address, right? So if I want to work on my laptop on this internet connection that's going into this computer that I'm sitting in front of, I would have to figure out the MAC address of this, then I'm going to put it on my laptop and then hopefully I'll get access uh, to the network, otherwise it won't work, okay? So that's spoofing. Um, it could be a file, right, uh, that's on your computer. So maybe I'm going and I'm looking up, maybe I'm, I'm the operating system of your computer, I'm looking at the permissions uh, for to in order to do something, okay, and then uh, you're somehow able to insert a fake file there that has fake permissions, and I believe it. I believe it's real. Um, one small thing uh, that I have a note of that comes up in spoofing is uh, there's a set of attacks uh, with a funny acronym T O C U T O U, uh, which means time of check versus time of use. Um, so time of check versus time of use is uh, is a general it, anyways, it, it's, it's one example of spoofing that comes up a lot. You see these kinds of vulnerabilities a lot, so I thought I'd just showcase it. So let me give you a really silly example. Um, let's say that you 
uh, want to go to the bar and you're not over 18 in Quebec, okay? But good news, you have a friend and, and they're over 18 or whatever, okay? Uh, so what you do is you go up to the, it's a club, so there's a security guard, so you go up to the security guard. You have your friend show their ID. The security guard checks the ID, they look at the face of the person, and they say, okay, they look at the birth date, and the birth date matches, okay? So they perform the check, and then they go to hand back the ID, and somehow you're able to jump into the position where your friend is standing, and you take the ID back instead, and then the security guard says, okay, you go, go into the club. Okay, now that sounds stupid, it's absurd, because you couldn't jump into that position fast enough without the security guard noticing, okay? But there was a difference here between uh, the time I checked, and then there was a bit of a gap, and then there was the time that I granted you access or permission to do what you were uh, supposed to do. So I was able to jump in and spoof at that moment. Now, while it sounds crazy in terms of humans doing this, in the digital world, that's, there's no constraint there, right? So an operating system might do a check, and then uh, operating systems get interrupted all the time, right? So they go off and they do something else. And then when they come back, the thing that they checked has been completely replaced, uh, for example. Question? Is it the same as delegating? Uh, delegating is slightly different. Um, so delegating would be, uh, um, I have permission to do something, so I want to give you permission uh, to do it. And so delegation is an attack. This is an attack. Delegation is a property that you would want from systems, but then there are attacks that are associated uh, with delegation as well. So it's slightly different, but related. Yeah. Email spoofing. Email spoofing, uh, yeah. So, so that's another example of, of spoofing itself. So that's not really time of check versus time of use, but it is, uh, going back to this, uh, an example of, of um, spoofing itself. <laughs> So uh, for example, in email, for the longest time, uh, you could basically pretend to be any email address you wanted. So if you wanted a, an email to appear as being sent from j.clark at concordia.ca, which is my email address, you could send that to a friend of yours and you could put that in you know, the from field and, and then it would show up at your friend's email client in Gmail as if it came from me. Okay. Uh, now there's better security uh, around that and so there are certain protocols uh, that are in place that, that make that a lot harder uh, to do. And so it's going to depend on your client itself, but, but that's one example. Another is telephone spoofing. So you get you know, calls from telemarketers and they might be somewhere else in the world, but yet the number's coming up as a local number. And so it's just a spoofed, uh, spoofed number. Okay, uh, tampering. Uh, so tampering is uh, where you actually go and you modify uh, something. So you change something. So something, it's supposed to be a certain way, and you're actually changing it itself. Um, so it could be data or code as the example that's given. So that's, that's a very sort of easy example. So data would be like, say the email's going across the wire, and I change the message inside the email, right? Then it shows up at your email client, and it's been changed. Okay, so that would be an example of integrity. Sorry, uh, of tampering. Integrity is the property uh, that, that's being violated. It could be software or something like that. Like say I install malware on your computer, uh, that, that would be an example of tampering. Uh, it could be something physical, right? You have a voting machine and it's not supposed to leak uh, how you voted, but somehow I'm able to tamper with it. And so when you vote for Alice, it records the vote for Bob. And because I physically put some electronic device on it or I pulled out the one chip and replaced it with the other chip or I added Wi-Fi capability so I can like monitor what you're doing, uh, whatever the case may be. Okay, so that's, that's tampering. Uh, we'll talk about tampering with humans uh, as well uh, in social engineering, so that, that's another aspect. Uh, okay, the next one is uh, repudiation. Uh, so the flip side of it is, is non-repudiation. This one's kind of weird, uh, but basically uh, repudiation says you deny having done something that you actually did do. Okay, so you go, you do something, you make a payment and you receive, like I buy something off of Amazon and the thing comes, it's in my house, I have it, but yet I go call up Amazon support and say, uh, I never received it, right? It got lost in the mail, okay? Uh, so that would be an example of repudiation. Uh, so I deny it. And in this case, Amazon would probably refund me if I do it once, but if I do it 10 times, then they're not gonna refund me anymore. 
uh, and they might start investigating me. Um, so yeah, I, it could be I did send that email, I, I didn't modify that file, whatever, whatever the case may be. Um, okay, information disclosure is basically leaking information that should be private. So there's some information, and privacy is sort of a weird concept. Uh, one way to think about it is just in terms of access. So like some people have access to the data and some people don't. Okay, so privacy is usually never like a, a fully binary thing where it's like, okay, that's something that like nobody knows, right? Like think of your medical records. It's like most people don't know about it, but your doctors or some people know about it. Some people are able to add to it, but they're not able to see like what your past history is. Uh, some people can see everything. Uh, sometimes you need to authorize it, uh, but if I'm unconscious, I can't authorize it, so I want it to be available, you know, even if I don't authorize it. Right, and so there's different access control rules that you could write about data. Um, so information disclosure is a breach of confidentiality. Now sometimes it's a little more, like we'll talk later about cookies, for example, in the context of, of web security and how they're used for tracing. And so that's like something that's, that's a little harder to kind of put your finger on and, and it's more of a general privacy uh, consideration. And so uh, information disclosure, yeah, it can take different forms, sometimes it's it's like you're reading something that you shouldn't read, it's very clear cut. But in other cases, it's sort of, you know, in terms of like a broader kind of concept like privacy. Uh, denial of service uh, is basically trying to stop someone from accessing something uh, that they have. Um, so you might, you know, the, the, the main example, I guess, is, is the denial of service that you think of in terms of internet servers. Uh, so you wanna bring down a website uh, so you have, you're, you start spamming it with as much traffic as you can, uh, but the website probably has bigger pipes than you, and so you get all your friends to join in. Uh, so that's called yeah. distributed denial of service or DDoS attacks. And even now that might not be enough, maybe they're behind Cloudflare or something like that. Uh, there's another form uh, that you can do that's a little more advanced, which is kind of fun. I'll just I'll give you a taste of, of this. Uh, slightly different. Oh, yeah, maybe. Yes, so it, it combines reflection. Uh, so it's called an amplification attack. So traditionally with denial of service in the server case, uh, you would have a user and the user would direct as much traffic as they can at the website and hopefully the website stays up, okay? Uh, the main thing to, to understand is that uh, if real users are accessing your website, you have no way of telling the difference, right? So you, you have to service everyone even if it's just to throw the packet away because it's, it's not formed. But like if you uh, can't keep up with the incoming traffic, then you're denying your real users access to your server as well because you can't, you can't tease them apart. Unless if there's some like telltale sign, like all the bad traffic's coming from a certain geographic area, then maybe there's something you can do uh, to do it. But anyways, um, so originally that was denial of service, then it was you get all your friends uh, to join in uh, and that's called distributed denial of service. Uh, the latest kinds of attacks we see is slightly different. It's called amplification attacks. Uh, it, it involves uh, reflection. And this is kind of cool because it combines spoofing uh, as well as uh, denial of service. So the ultimate goal is denial of service, uh, but it uses spoofing uh, as a method in order to do it. And so the basic approach is um, there's some protocols uh, on the internet that run over, most, most of the internet runs on TCP. Okay, so TCP is a network protocol that allows two parties to connect to each other. Uh, it, pro it provides reliability. So if packets get dropped, uh, the receiver is going to notice it. There's some checks, and then they're going to ask for those uh, packets to be sent again, uh, and then those packets will be sent again. Uh, an alternative to TCP is called UDP. Uh, UDP is used uh, for, like, say, say you're on Zoom, okay? Maybe there's packets that are being dropped, but by the time you realize they're dropped and you ask for it again, like the, the audio and the video has like moved on. So even if you get those packets, but they're a second late, there's no way for you to like go back and put them in the right place. Unless if you have like one second delay or like buffering or something like that. Um, so generally with UDP, you just spam it as fast as you can and, uh, and you hope it gets through. And if it doesn't get through, it gets dropped and it's not critical uh, that it gets dropped. So, um, some stuff that's, that's really traffic heavy uses UDP. Uh, also like little requests where you can always ask again. If you don't get an answer right away, you just ask again. Maybe the packet got dropped, whatever. Um, okay, now the thing about UDP is because they don't do a handshake, 
uh, between the two parties, uh, you don't actually know who you're talking to, okay? And so if someone sends you a request over UDP, what they can do is they can spoof the IP address and they could say, actually, this request is coming from someone else, okay? So let's just think through that. So let's say that you have Alice. This is where I would prefer to be able to draw this out. But anyways, let's say you have Alice and she sends a UDP request to Bob. Uh, so Bob's going to respond uh, to Alice, okay? But Alice could do, what she could do is she could say, actually, I'm Carol. So Alice is sending a UDP, UDP request to, or it's not a request, it's just traffic uh, to Bob saying that she's Carol, okay? So Bob will receive it thinking he got it from Carol, and then he'll send the response back to Carol, okay? Now in TCP, this won't happen. In TCP, what will happen is Alice will say, I'm Carol, and Bob will say, hi, Carol, I'm Bob, and Carol will say, I don't know what you're talking about, right? Like, you're, you're trying to tell me you're Bob, but like, I didn't ask you who you were, okay? So because there's a handshake, uh, basically the protocol would fall apart at that point. But with UDP, uh, you can spoof the IP address that it's coming from. Uh, and then when you send the data, the person's going to respond to the IP address that they received, okay? As if that was who it came from, okay? So the nice thing that you could do, not nice, maybe not nice thing that you can do, um, is what you could do is you could pick a website that you want to bring down, okay? And you could find like some server on the internet uh, you might go looking like in the real backbone of the internet. So like one that like has been patched up for many years now, but was sort of the big example of, of these kinds of attacks, you know, maybe five years ago uh, was something called NTP. So NTP is network time protocol. Uh, it's basically uh, servers, you know, they want to know the timing of things because packets get dropped and they want to know like how long it's been. And, you know, having to know like what time it is, is, is important. And because the internet's distributed a bunch, a bun, amongst a bunch of different computers, they all have different times, okay? So what almost every server that was on the internet offered is they offered a server where, service where you could come up to the server and just say, what time is it? And they would say, okay, it's, this is the time, okay? Uh, and so the idea was that like, if you want synchronized clocks or something like that, uh, then you would be able to do it. So almost all servers had this functionality uh, turned on. So you could go to any of these servers and, and ask, uh, what time it is. Now you could also ask for other stuff too. So you could be like, what time is it? Like who are the last, I don't know, 100 people who have connected to you? Uh, and there, there were different things that this protocol supported. And so this, uh, this uh, server would reply uh, with all the information, okay? Now let's put two ideas together, okay? The one idea is that you can spoof an IP address. So what I could do is say, I'm Alice. I could go to Bob and say, what time is it? But say I'm Kara, right? I'm, I'm really Alice, but I'm Carol, what time is it? Then Bob's going to send the time to Carol, okay? So big deal. Um, so let's say I want to do a, a denial of service. I could do it like indirectly that way. So I could reflect it uh, being, uh, so if I want to take down Carol's computer, I just go to Bob and say, what time is it? What time is it? What time is it? What time is it? And Bob says it's, you know, uh, it's 1924, 1924, 1924 to Carol, okay? But basically, as fast as I can ask Bob for the time, that's as fast as Bob is going to hit Carol with traffic, okay? So I might as well just send traffic to Carol directly. Like, it's not helping me to route it through Bob, okay? But here's the second key idea. What if asking for what time it is is really small? I can do it really fast because it's really small, but the response is really big. Let's say the response is 10 times bigger than the request then if I'm hitting it at a certain rate and that server can keep up, it's responding to Carol with 10 times the rate. Okay, it's sending 10 times uh, the amount of traffic. Okay, so I could be a small computer with like, or a small like internet connection with not a lot of bandwidth, but if I can hit one of these backbone internet servers that have a ton of bandwidth because they're critical infrastructure to the internet and get them to send a response that's 10 or 100 times larger, right? then, uh, then they, they'll, they'll send a lot of traffic uh, to Carol. So you can see this sort of depicted. So Alice is basically hammering the server as fast as she can with a small amount of traffic. And she spoofs the website's uh, IP address uh, in terms of the response. And uh, so that's sort of depicted here. I guess I can't remember since I drew this last time. But um, Actually, don't no, ignore the, the stuff in pink for now. So Alice is hitting the, the uh, server and the server is amplifying it 
you know, 10 times to 100 times as big, and so the website is, is getting hammered. Okay, then what you can do is you can go back and you can go back to the distributed denial service and get your friends to do the same thing. Okay, so you get all of your friends to pick their favorite NTP server. You all pick a different server so you're not overloading that one server, and all of you are amplifying all of your traffic and it's all going to the website. Okay, and then, and then that could uh, bring that website down. So NTP was kind of the classic example. DNSSEC is another protocol that runs over UDP. It, you can say, you know, give me the domain name for um, this IP address. And now because there's all these signatures involved, so DNSSEC is the secure version, you're getting this huge blob of data back. There's all these certificates and things like that. So your request is really small and you're getting something that could be like, like 10 or 100 times bigger uh, than the request back. So that's another uh, aspect of it. But Okay, anyways, that, that was just for fun. I like to show uh, different attacks when I can. Uh, so let's go back to stride. So that's the now service. Um, the last uh, kind of attack is escalation of privilege or elevation of privilege. And so in this kind of attack, you uh, can think of a system where you have permissions in place. So different people are allowed uh, to do certain things and certain people are not allowed uh, to do certain things. Uh, and what you're able to do is you're able to find some way to circumvent uh, that access structure. So you're able to get permissions that you shouldn't have uh, somehow. So for example, um, well, the example that's given is like, think of your computer. I, I don't know, I haven't used Windows in a long time, but um, it used to be like you have super users and a min and things like that. On Linux or on OS, there, there's like a super user or a min access. And so let's say you're installing software. Uh, you might be able to install it as a user, but you might need, if it's doing like deep changes to the uh, system, to the kernel, uh, then you have to give it permission. So you might have to type in your password or something like that. But operating systems are really big, they're complicated, there's lots of people asking and there's different you know, ways of handling different requests. And, and so what happens is someone finds a way uh, where they can install software on your computer without the computer asking your permission to do it. Right? Maybe even from a website, so like you just go to a, a website and all of a sudden you get a rootkit that's installed on your computer that you should have to you know, download and it's gonna like walk you through the installation and make you type in the password and stuff. But somehow it's just, it's just happening. Okay, so that's a classic escalation of privilege. Uh, you might think of the uh, lock screen on your phone. Uh, so this now has gotten a lot of attention, but when iPhones first came out, like the first versions of iOS, there were all sorts of ways where you could bypass the lock screen. So you pick it up and you would, I don't know, turn the camera on and then press three buttons or like you do some weird thing uh, and then it would crash and then it would kind of reboot without the lock screen or like, or like the lock screen would just disable or I don't know, you make an emergency call and then hang up and then it would bump you back into like the unlocked phone as opposed to the locked phone. I don't remember the exact concrete examples, but um, that's an example of escalation of privilege. Okay, so the, that vulnerability shouldn't be there, but yet somehow it is there. Uh, so escalation of privileges show up in uh, procedures. And so we'll spend some time uh, on procedures. I'll show you one attack, for example, in, in terms of airport security. So let's say you're on a no-fly list, you're not allowed to fly. Uh, that's a permission that you don't have. But what if I told you there was a way with like a certain combination of showing different IDs to different people uh, where you could fly even though you're on the no flight list? That would be an escalation of privilege attack. So I'll show you an example of that that doesn't work anymore because it's like 10 years old, but anyways. Okay, uh, actually before I scroll too far, uh, uh, is there questions about Stride, about any of these or comments? Uh, for example, talking about DLL. So let's say I have a DLL. Let's say an executable uses a certain DLL, and I inject a DLL that comes in the first priority, let's say in directory, current directory where the, execu the executable is being executed. So actually, I'm spoofing the original DLL with my own. So is it considered spoofing or not? Or yeah, yeah. So if you, it depends, I guess, on what. What's supposed to stop that from happening? So the, the two that come to mind is it could be spoofy and also sounds like escalation of privilege, right? Because your DLL shouldn't have the permission to run if it came from a source that isn't like a legitimate source, right? Um, and so the question is, 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 so then you can look at the property that's being violated and say, okay, is this an authentication issue or is it an authorization issue? So is the operating system getting confused because 
it thinks you have one file, but it's, it's, it's mistaking your file for another file? Or is it an authorization issue where it's mistaking whether you have the permission to run or not? So in this case, it sounds like authentication, right? And so I would classify that as a spoofing attack, yeah. Um, so th these classifications aren't always perfect. So sometimes like attacks uh, fall, like they might fall into one of two categories uh, and it's not always like super clear cut uh, which category they fall into. The other thing is that most attacks combine lots of different steps, okay? And so uh, one thing I will promise you is there will be an exam question on the final exam that says, blah, blah, blah happen is that S, T, R, I, D, or E, okay? All right, so that's like a classic exam question, okay? So uh, be prepared for that. So um, like I say, sometimes they're not clear cut, so you, you have to like really think about it. And the other thing is you have to think about the actual attack itself and not the motivation for doing the attack. So like, for example, let's say I wanna spy on you. That's like information disclosure, but I'm doing it by tampering with your phone, right? So it's sort of like, is that a tampering attack? Cause I, I'm like, I'm doing the attack by tampering with your phone, but the goal of the attack is to spy on you and that's information disclosure. So which of the two is it? And so you always pick the one that's closest or most proximate to it. So I tampered with your phone, who cares why I'm doing it? The, I tampered with your phone, that's a tampering attack, okay? So the reason why, and I, I won't try to trick you on the exam, I'll try and give you like nice clear cut examples. And a lot of times I won't tell you the why, like why is the person doing this? But sometimes you, you get so smart and you're thinking ahead and you're like, well, they're doing this obviously because they wanna do this. Right, and then you classify it in terms of what what the attacker wants to do, uh, as opposed to, to to yeah. Anyway, so um, you can expect example or questions like that. I uh, by the way, for the final exam, there are some sample questions on the website, and the course has changed so much since I wrote those sample examples uh, it, questions that that they are almost useless. Uh, but I would say maybe 25% of them are still relevant, and there are a couple stride ones. But I also learned the hard way from writing them down that, that yeah, some, if, I'm not, if I'm not super careful myself, I can easily write down a proper, or a attack where it would have one or two uh, properties. So on the sample exam questions, there, there are a couple I think where you would get the mark if you either said it was tampering or you said it was escalation of privilege or whatever. It's usually tampering and escalation of privilege. Those are, are two that, that um, tend to be harder to separate. But anyways, I've gotten better through experience of writing exams and so now I think I have I'll, for your final exam, I'll come up with some new examples that I promise will be very clear cut and you'll have no question about which category they fall into. Okay, other uh, questions or comments about Stride? Okay, so Stride is fine. It's, uh, it's just a light uh, kind of brainstorming exercise uh, that you can use uh, if you want to. Um, uh, if, you, if you're just starting to think about security for the very first time, uh, then you can, um, uh, you can use Stride. Okay, so that's actually all I'm gonna say about Stride. We won't spend a lot of time on it. Um, I'll introduce you to the next example, but we won't have time to go through it uh, com completely, uh, but we'll, we'll finish it up next class. Um, okay, so the next thing is called an evaluation framework. And so this is something that's useful uh, for comparing different alternatives. So if you have different things that do the same thing, or they promise to do the same thing and you wanna compare them. Uh, and generally, because it's a security course, you're thinking about which is most secure. So you can have that question in the back of your mind. So you're looking at five things, five different, I don't know, intrusion detection systems and you're trying to figure out which one is the most secure, okay? And the general principle from, lots of people do this, a lot of academics do it. There's lots of papers that have these now. And uh, the general thing that I've seen almost across the board is when you do this exercise, uh, you find that, as economists say, there's no solutions, there's only trade-offs. Meaning that there's never a clear-cut answer of like, this is more secure than this. It's always, well, this is more secure, but it's slower, or it's, you know, whatever. There's some, it costs more, or it's more, it's harder to deploy, or whatever the case may be, okay? So there's always like different combinations of how secure something is. And it also depends on your properties. You might have 10 security properties, and this one's good for these five, but not good for the other five. And this one's, you know, another solution is good. So I'll show you an example of that uh, in, in a second. Um, evaluation framework looks really simple when you're done. Okay, so sometimes in your assignments, I'll make you do one. I haven't decided this year if I'll, I'll make you do one, but uh, it looks really simple. 
Um, but I promise you it's actually a lot, it's really hard to, to actually do, to get it into a nice clean solution. But anyways, what it looks like at the end is basically a simple chart, okay? So a chart will have a bunch of rows and the rows will be the different alternatives that you're comparing. And then you'll have a bunch of columns and the columns will say like, it's secure in this aspect, it's secure in this aspect, it's secure in this aspect. And then, you know, for each of the rows, you're going to like get a grade. Or what I like to do and I'll argue is, is, is a really simple approach is just like say whether it has a property or not. Does it satisfy the property or not? So you might, we'll use dots. So for example, we'll give it a dot if it, if it uh, satisfies it and there'll be an empty dot if it doesn't. And sometimes you're really nitpicky and you're like, well, it kind of half solves it, but doesn't fully solve it. So then you can throw a half dot at it, okay? But you can do a lot with just no dot, half dot, full dot, okay? So you don't have to do like really detailed analysis. But the, the, um, the, the main benefit of this, or the, the main thing that, that I'm trying to get you to do uh, when you think about this is I want you to think beyond security. So I'm making it really easy to do the evaluations themselves, the individual evaluations, because I want you to consider lots of criteria under which to evaluate something, okay? And I don't want you to just look at security. So security, as we say, it often trades off with other things. Sometimes security trades off with security. So you have certain security properties and as you lock them down, it makes harder, it's harder to lock down other uh, security properties. So like an example would be, um, let's say I have my Bitcoin key, okay? So I have this like key that, that has all my Bitcoin, right? And I have to store it somewhere. And if someone gets access to it, uh, then they can steal all my Bitcoin. If I lose it, I lose all my Bitcoin. Okay, Bitcoin's not like a bank. There's no password resets. You can't go in person. It's like very unforgiving, right? Like either you have the key or you don't, okay? So like very simply, I might be like, I really, I'm scared of losing it. And like, not just like I'll misplace it, but like what if my house burns down and, and like the key's in the house or something like that, or there's a hurricane or something. So. I'm like, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna make 10 copies of the key. Okay, so I'm gonna make 10. I'm gonna have one in my office, one in my knapsack, one in, at home, one in a safe. I'll give one to a friend, whatever, okay? So the more, the better, right? So if I wanna improve that like safety property, like I'm not gonna lose it, then the more keys I make, the better, right? Now the problem is the more keys I make, the more opportunity for them to get stolen, right? If I have 10 of them, well, you just steal my knapsack and you have my key. Right, or you break into my office and you have my key, or my house, take your pick, whatever one's easiest, right? And so the more copies I have, then I'm like, okay, I only have to have one copy, right? If I only have, I can't have no copies, that would be the best, right? But I, I have to have, I just want one copy. I don't wanna make a whole bunch of copies because I'm gonna really protect that one copy. I'm gonna put it in a safety deposit box at a bank or something like that. Okay, so that's a basic security trade-off, right? One security property, the fact that I'm scared I'm gonna lose it says make lots of copies of it. And another security property that says I don't want someone to steal it says don't make a lot of copies of it, okay? Now maybe there's some clever way you can think of like kind of to, to break that trade off. But anyways, that's an example of security breaking off with security. But there's lots of other things that security break off or trades off with. Um, so deployability considerations. How much does it cost? Uh, what do you have to change? Do you need all your users to upgrade all their computers? You need them all to go out and buy a new device uh, that they're going to carry around with them, right? Um, usability, right? Uh, can a human actually use the system? Uh, do they know how to use it? Are they going to make errors uh, when they use it? Do they, do they have to memorize things? Uh, do they have to recognize that, oh, that looks weird, so I shouldn't do that, right? Do I have to read some error dialogue that's like, certificate domain name mismatch and know that that's actually a really serious thing. Or it's not a serious thing and I should just click ignore, right? Like, so what are you expecting uh, of your users? And so what an evaluation framework does is you don't have to strictly break it along these three lines, but it's pretty useful. It, 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 I've seen it deployed in lots of different contexts for studying lots of different, the security of lots of different things, uh, where basically you have a security, sometimes you have a privacy, uh, depending on if, if you consider those separate or, or together, but you have some sort of security criterias, uh, you have some usability uh, criterias, and then you have your deployability uh, criterias, okay? Uh, so you can do more than that, uh, but, but those three uh, tend to be quite sufficient. Okay, so when you're done, it would look kind of like this. Uh, so you would have just a little chart. The rows would be your three alternatives, and then you have some properties uh, and then basically it would say whether it has that property or not. 
it's not any different than if you're, I don't know, say you're buying a car and, and you know, you go to your favorite dealership and then they give you a chart like this and they're like, okay, here's our car, here's the competitors, here's like three competitors. And then they, they're like, okay, this one has like six speed, but this other one's five speed or whatever. So, you know, the, the actual deliverable is not remarkable, right? It's, it's actually very simple to look at, it's easy to consume. Uh, but the hard work comes into choosing those properties correctly, making sure that you get all of them so you're comprehensive. Um, and uh, finding your alternatives, making sure they're truly alternatives, uh, things like that. Uh, so these are, are um, the kinds of things that, that, that get tricky. So a few tips before I show you a concrete example is uh, the properties, we always try to phrase them positively, meaning that you want to satisfy that property. So let's say that you're, I don't know, you have an intrusion detection system and it's not vulnerable to some attack, right? Uh, you could say, like, if you made a table like this, you might be like, okay, is it it's vulnerable to this attack. Is it vulnerable to attack A, okay? In that case, you wouldn't want the dots, right? You don't want your system uh, to be vulnerable to attack A. So then some of your properties, it's like you want the dot, and some of the properties, you don't want the dot because of the way that they're phrased. And then it's really hard if I just look at it and I'm like, like right now, if I, like alternative one looks good, right? It gets the most dots, right? Really simple, right? Uh, but, but if some of those are properties I don't want, then maybe getting a dot is a bad thing, okay? So what you have to do is when you write your properties, you have to phrase them. It's just an English thing where you have to like kind of reverse the phrasing sometimes. But you're going to phrase them positively so that you, it's always phrased in terms of the dot is what you want, okay? So then visually, the more dots you see, the better it is generally, okay? Um, if you were to do this in assignment, theoretically, uh, I would expect an explanation of every dot, okay? And of every property. So what's a property? What does it take to get a full dot? What does it take to get a half dot? What does it take to get a no dot? And then for alternative three, why did you give it a full dot instead of a half dot, okay? And generally, I don't care like so much about whether you get your dots exactly right or if I would do it if I would come up with the same things as, as you would or things like that. I just want you to be consistent uh, and, and actually explain what you're doing. Uh, that, that tends to be the, the most important thing. Okay. Um, Okay, so the next thing is this table is meant to be sort of neutral. Uh, it's not necessarily meant to sell you on alternative one as opposed to alternative three, right? It's really up to the reader to look at it and say, you know, alternative one gets all the, the, the most dots, but maybe property three is actually the most important property. Maybe I actually really care about property three. And so I actually like alternative three, even though it doesn't get as many dots as alternative one, that third property is just so important to me that, that I want alternative three because it has the full dot. Okay, so your, your job isn't to sell someone on uh, which alternative they should choose. It's really to just say, okay, here's all the alternatives and here's the properties and it's very neutral. It's just like, do with it whatever you want. Okay, we're just, I'm just telling you this. Okay, um, the, the kind of approach that you don't have to follow but, but usually works pretty nice is, yeah, if you give it a full dot, it achieves the property. Uh, if you doesn't achieve the property, you don't give it a dot. And then you can have some half dot, or I have a kind of empty circle as a, a half dot, uh, which basically says that it does achieve the property kind of, but there's some caveats or there's some, you know, sort of half achieves it or whatever. And those ones you have to be really careful. You have to really spell out like, okay, what, what does it mean to get a half dot? Um, so yeah. Okay, so we're gonna do uh, an example of this. Actually, we're, we're not going, we're gonna do it and then we're also going to look at a paper that did it much better than we're going to do in class, okay? Uh, so you'll see what, we'll brainstorm our own, uh, our own evaluation framework so you can sort of get the feeling for how it goes. Then I'll show you what an academic paper evaluation framework would look like uh, in a, like a top tier uh, venue and you'll, you'll see that it's much more detailed uh, but, but you'll get the uh, kind of, um, you'll get the gist of it uh, from what we do in class. Okay. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to look at uh, passwords uh, as our example. And uh, specifically what we're going to do is we're going to look at, uh, so this is meant to evaluate lots of different alternatives. Okay. So now uh, we have different alternatives to passwords. So passwords isn't the only way. Think about a website, right? The website wants you to log in. 
Uh, you can create a password. You can remember your password. Uh, ideally, with a password, you know, the security advice from the 1980s and 1990s is every single website, you have a different password. You know, it's a long, complicated password, and you remember it, and you never write it down. And so you have, you know, for all the 200 sites or 1,000 sites that you have, uh, uh, you have passwords for, you have a unique password for all of them, right? That was the old mental model. And maybe it worked in the internet where you would only log into five different sites, okay? But nowadays that just doesn't work, okay? And so people have said, oh, we have a solution to this, okay? We're gonna get rid of that password problem where I memorize every password that I have, okay? So what are some examples? You should, you should know lots of these. So what are some examples of, of what you might do instead of, instead of just saying, create a new password for my website? OTP. OK, OTP. So tell me what that is. OK, good. Yeah, so uh, I'm going to call that slightly. So OTP is a slightly different thing. But uh, what you describe is called two-factor authentication, usually. Um, so uh, often it's, and what, what problem is it trying to solve? The problem it's trying to solve is just because you, someone's showing up and they have your password, but do I actually believe it's you, right? And so from a security perspective, if I can have more evidence that it's you, that would be great. And so two-factor is, well, um, in general, there's factors like what, something you know, something you are, something you have, right? And so if I can ask about something you have in addition to something you know, then I can be more confident than it's you. So I know you have a phone and you have a phone number. And so I'm going to, uh, generally I'm still going to ask for your password, but in addition, I'm going to send a text code, a code to, you know, over SMS to your phone. Uh, and then you're going to tell me that. And then now I know you know your password and I know you have your phone. So I'm more confident that it's you. Yeah. So that's one where uh, the goal is really to increase the security. So two-factor increases security over a normal password. Does it make anything worse? Is it strictly better? Okay, so there could be some reliability issues with it. Okay, so you could lose your phone, so you might get locked out of your account. Does everyone have a phone? I mean, everyone in the room here probably has a phone, but does everyone in the world have a phone? Everyone who's on the internet? Not necessarily. Uh, is it, does it take, it's shorter to log in if you uh, have to do this two-factor authentication? If you have to log into 100 sites, would you rather do it with just a normal password or would you rather do it with two-factor authentication? Okay, so there's some usability trade-off uh, in terms of there. Okay, so these are the kinds of questions that we'll ask. Okay. Uh, OAuth, okay, so explain it. So OAuth is where you have a, um, a service that authenticates you, uh, and then the service uh, vouches that you are who you are, or you say you are what you're no, Open ID command. Okay, okay, yeah, so OAuth, Open ID, these are open standards for that type of thing. I'll call it single sign-on, uh, so that's, that's a term that, that covers OAuth. Uh, so the more... Um, yeah, so the example you might think of is like Facebook or Twitter. So like I go to, I download an app, it wants me to create an account. Instead of me creating a new username and password for this thing, I'll just log in through Facebook and then somehow Facebook will uh, authenticate this app within Facebook and then, uh, and then if I'm able to demonstrate that I can log into my Facebook account, then it will, uh, it will consider me to be me uh, in terms of logging in the, into the site. So. Apple, Google, you know, uh, lots of different uh, people, Twitter, uh, uh, provide that uh, kind of single side. And then there's OAuth and like ones that are built on open standards and things like that uh, as well as alternatives. Yeah, so that's that's another thing that, that people use. Password it, managers. Okay, password managers. Uh, so what's the what's the story with the password manager? I guess it's a software where it stores all the passwords that is related to the website or application to its users. Okay. So Okay, good. So, uh, yeah, so password managers, um, uh, so it's going to store the passwords for you so you don't have to remember them. So that's, it's solving a usability problem for you. Um, is it better in terms of security? No, maybe someone may access. Okay, so if I get access to your password manager, then I have all your passwords, yeah. right? Uh, so, so that could be a, a, a breach. So, um, so there's a trade-off uh, in terms of, of that, but it's more convenient. 
Uh, password managers also do some fun things like, first off, they'll generate passwords for you so they're secure and they're random and long and uh, hard to brute force. Um, another thing is that, let's say I create an account on whatever, Google, and then I accidentally go to Google with three O's instead of two O's, and there's some like website pretending to be Google, my password manager will not fill that in. Even though me as a human, I'm tricked, I think it's the real Google, and the interface looks like Google, the page looks like Google, everything looks like Google, the URL does not match. And so, and I don't remember my password because that's why I have a password manager. So I couldn't even type it in even if I remember it, and I can't get my password manager to type it in. And so maybe that saves me. Maybe I manually like unlock it in my password manager and then copy and paste it. But, but anyways, it, it could save me in that case. So yeah, things like that. Another thing, actually, just to go back to single sign-on. Uh, so single sign-on sounds great, right? Instead of having one password, or sorry, instead of having a thousand passwords, you have one password, mm -hmm. right? Uh, once again, there's a concentration. So if I'm able to break your Google account, then I can get access to all of your websites. Is there any other things that you can think of where single sign-on would be worse uh, than just having passwords? So there's, those are the benefits, that's why it's better. So there's that concentration of, of your data in one place. So there's a single point of failure. So that's one main reason against it. Can anyone think of another reason against it? Uh, privacy, if you don't want site B to know you have an account with site A, then you can't use site A to log into site B? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, so privacy is the other big one. So uh, it's, it's not just that Facebook knows that you have an account, but every single time you log into that account, Facebook knows it. So they know when you're logging in, uh, yeah, like they know that you're active uh, and all of that. So, so it, it's like very rich data uh, for, for them. And that's why, that's why you see Google and Apple and Facebook offer these services, because it's not free, right? They have to put up servers. Their servers have to connect to other things. Those things might be super popular. It might be a lot of bandwidth, okay? It's not free for, for Google to do that. Uh, so why are they doing that? Well, they're, they're making money somewhere. Right, and so they're they're building a digital dossier of the kinds of apps that you want to use, and also frequency, time of use, uh, and those kinds of things, and that's that's valuable information to them. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah, so both of those are, are good things. So uh, first thing, hardware tokens. Uh, so you might have some like physical kind of thing. Uh, in some cases, your primary authentication. So you just, you have the, like I have a card, an RFID card, right? And it lets me into the wing of my office. Uh, and so if I have the, if you take the card from me, it's in my pocket, uh, you can take it, you can go into my office. Uh, so that's, that's it. Um, sometimes it's combined with uh, two-factor authentication. So like one common, uh, commonly used token is uh, called an RSA token. Uh, and so this is like something that shows you, it's the same thing like when you get a message, a text message with a random number, but now it's a hardware device that's on your keychain. And so you push a button, it gives you a number, and then when you log in, you log in with your password and you put that number in as well. Uh, and then that serves as something you have in addition to something you know. And then, there's, so there's something you know that would be like a password Maybe it's a master password for a password manager, or it's just you know all, you, the thousand passwords that you've memorized. Uh, there's something you have, like a phone or a token. And then the third category is something you are, and so that's where biometrics comes in. So uh, it could be a fingerprint, uh, it could be an iris scan. Um, those are, are the two most common ones. Okay. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, so uh, biometrics, uh, just generally before we go into a deep dive on it, like w are they better or worse than passwords? Okay, so like why, why are they better? They are better in certain regards. What's, why are they better? You can't lose your fingerprint. Okay, so they're harder to lose. Now, can you lose your fingerprint? And then what happens, <laughs> right? So I cut your finger off and then I go around. I, I can lift your fingerprint, right? If you're touching something, I can lift it and make a synthetic 3D printed uh, finger that has your fingerprint on it. Um, so, so yeah, but anyways, that, that was the thinking. They're very convenient, right? You just, like my computer has a fingerprint reader. It's a lot easier than typing a password in. Uh, my phone has facial recognition. It's a lot. Actually, I wouldn't say it's easier, especially now with COVID and we're all wearing masks. It's, it's, you're always putting your password in anyways. 
Um, but yeah, yeah, so, so there is usability improvements, uh, definitely. Uh, is it more secure? So maybe, maybe not. So I'm gonna argue that it's actually easier. It depends on how you're generating your passwords, but I'll argue that generally passwords have more entropy, which is the sort of critical uh, component uh, than biometrics do, at least biometrics. The problem with biometrics is you can pull a lot of data off a fingerprint, but then it's also very sensitive to like any changes. Like the more data that you pull, like the, the more precise you are about the fingerprint, you're expecting that level of precision the next time and the next time in a year from now, right? So if you have a sort of fuzzy matching to the fingerprint, then it's very robust. It's unlikely to change. It's unlikely that the same person's going to come back five years later and their fingerprint will look different because you're not looking very precisely at every like nook and cranny of the fingerprint. On the other hand, you can, you can make it very precise, but then you, know, you could get just a scratch on your skin or you know, the, the surface of your skin changes. I don't know, there's, there's lots of different ways where little things that could change and then it's very sensitive to it, right? Uh, it's very picky. So that's another sort of security with security trade-off. Um, there's almost like a, a, a legal thing too with that where in, it, depending on legal jurisdiction, but um, having something that you know, you cannot always be forced to compel to give it to the, the like if you're arrested or whatever because it's self-incrimination and usually there's laws against that in most places in, in the free world. Um, but on the other hand, a lot of places don't consider uh, like a, a fingerprint or a facial ID as something that the police can't take from you. So if you have a fingerprint, they can put your finger on the phone and unlock it. But if you have a password, they can't make you give them your password. Right, right. Okay. Yeah. So that's a really nice example of, um, so that's something that's like so nuanced that even in the academic paper, I don't think they had a good category that captured that. Uh, but that's certainly an aspect as well. And that's what I want you to think of is these really long tail examples of, of things. Like, so in this case, it's a privacy consideration basically of whether you can compel it. It's also just like mechanically, can you compel it? Like if I'm police, I can take your fingerprint, but I can't force you to say it. Maybe I can torture you or something, but um, I can't just directly like pull it out of your brain. Uh, yeah, so it's coercion resistance uh, would be what I would call that property. And, and so yeah, different ones could have different properties along that line. Um, okay, any any other uh, kinds of passwords that you've seen? Say again? Yeah, okay, perfect. So we call these graphical passwords. So instead of remembering a string of alphanumerical characters and special characters, you remember something visual, right? So the, the main thing is the, the swipe pa pattern on Android. Um, there, there have been lots of experiments where people will like, show you pictures, like when you set your password, they'll show you like two pictures and you'll pick one. And then they'll show you another two pictures and you'll pick one of the two. And then you do that like with 10 pictures, right? And then when you log in, they show you two pictures and you have to pick the exact same pictures. Or, you know, there's, there's pictures and you pick them in certain orders. And there is some promising usability studies that show that it's easier to remember this uh, than it is to remember uh, like alphanumeric uh, characters. And so, uh, yeah, so that was sort of a hot research area. It didn't really kind of take off uh, with the exception of, uh, I guess, the Android uh, unlock pattern. That's like probably the only graphical password. Sometimes it's used, I've seen it in, um, it's used more as an anti-phishing thing. So after you log in, they show you a picture that you set ahead of time. And if you don't see that picture, then you're supposed to say, oh, this might not be the real website. Although of course, at that point, it's kind of too late. You already gave the password. Uh, to it, but um, anyways, I've seen it more in that context, but yeah, I haven't seen like a true graphic password used in a while, but, but anyways, that's, that's an interesting thing. So um, usability may be improved. Uh, there's some, some studies, scientific studies that, that seem to suggest it. Uh, it's pretty fast, okay. Uh, what are the drawbacks? Uh, first off, it's a physical action, so if you're not capable of doing that physical action, um, probably if you could type a password in, uh, then you could also do the swipe pattern if you, like say you had a disability uh, or something like that that prevented you, um, you could maybe speak uh, it in or, or something like that or use assistive technology. Um, uh, so, but, but anyways, uh, you also can't do that kind of thing. Um, it's, well, it's easy on a phone to do like a swipe pattern. It's harder on a computer. So it's maybe not as portable across devices. Um, there's also weird attacks like smudge attacks where like I pick up your phone and I see like 
a certain smudge mark because you've unlocked it 10 times in the last hour and you haven't wiped your phone. And so I can infer. And if I throw machine learning or something at the, at the pattern, I can, there are like papers that show that you can very easily determine what someone's password is. So anyways, yeah, there's uh, different uh, considerations. But graphical passwords is one that we'll consider. Uh, anything else that anyone can think of? Ultraphonic uh, fingerprinting. S sorry? Ultraphonic fingerprinting. Address only? Ultraphonic, yeah. Ultrasound? Okay, sorry, it's but... Biometric. Oh, it's a biometric. Okay, okay. I don't know about that, but... Yeah, okay, so we'll put that under biometrics oh. as well. There's also a plis implicit authentication, which is sort of like how you type. Like, say you're typing, and uh, like the way I type is slightly different than the way you type. And uh, the way I hold the phone and things like that, or like when I swipe it, I sort of rotate the phone in certain areas. So that sometimes is used, usually it's not used as a strict authentication, but it might be like, say I've authenticated to the phone and it's unlocked, but now the phone is deciding when it should go back to sleep. And so as long as I continue to use it and it, my ma like biometrics match my sort of history, it's less likely to put it to sleep and ask for a password again. But if the biometrics go really weird, then it will just say, okay, you need to log in again, kind of thing. Um, so, so that, yeah, there are some solutions along uh, those lines. Uh, yeah, I've heard that term as like a marketing term, but what does it actually mean? Like, like you log into an application or something, and, and it gives you an option to like trust this device for like 10 days of period. Oh, I see, I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so that's not a, an alternative to passwords, it's, it's an extension of passwords, I guess. So it is, um, it's stopping you from putting your password in so much, but at the same time, you still, the password is the primary authentication mechanism. Yeah, yeah, so there's the question of, once you've done a password, biometric, hardware token, two-factor, then how long do you stay logged in? And if all of a sudden I'm coming from a different IP address, maybe Google makes me re-authenticate, even though I said I wanna stay logged in for 30 days or, or things like that. Um, so yeah, so th those are all, important decisions and you could do an evaluation framework of all those alternatives as well but they're not strict alternatives to passwords themselves anything else okay so your list is exactly the same as the list that uh that we came up with uh in past years with one exception so there's one that usually no students come up with because it's no one actually uses them um but uh i'll throw it into the mix as well uh, sometimes you have, actually, I, I gave a good example with the Bitcoin keys. So the Bitcoin keys is like actually a cryptographic file. Uh, sometimes there's a protocol called SSL or TLS, and you have like a client certificate that authenticates you. Um, sometimes it's used in email. So like say you're in an organization and you're going to sign your emails, then you need to have like some sort of certificate, which is a digital file, which basically signs off on your key saying it's, it's your, really your key and then all your emails, they automatically get signed. But the point is it's like a digital file that's on your computer, and that's what's going to authenticate you. Isn't that kind of a form of having something? Of which? Of having something? Yeah, 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 absolutely, yeah, yeah. So it's absolutely not, and so this is actually a good point to, to emphasize. A cryptographic key you can't memorize, or at least you're not going to memorize two or three of them. Maybe, maybe you could memorize one of them if you're lucky, but you're not going to memorize two or three of them. So it's absolutely something you have as opposed to something you know. So it's a file, it's on your computer, and if you wanna log in from multiple computers, you're gonna to have to make a copy of that file and, and port it over. Um, so you can start to see the usability. The usability pros is that you don't have to do anything, you just go to the website and you're automatically logged in. Because your certificate's sitting in your browser and the browser went and grabbed it, and that's it, right? Isn't that also how YubiKey works? Uh, yeah, so YubiKey is like a hardware token version of that as well, yeah, yeah. So we could put YubiKeys into this uh, it's the same category of like you have some sort of cryptographic key and it's it's a file or a device It's on a hardware device or something like that uh, in Bitcoin You have like YubiKey kind of things like like little hardware uh, USB things that you stick in and, and they have all your keys and stuff like that. But anyways um, yeah. uh, Okay, so why are they unpopular? So what are the drawbacks? Uh, so the first thing is you lose it you're done uh, so with a password, you can at least reset it, or there's some party that, that has control of it. Um, the second thing is it's, uh, um, well, okay, if it's token-based, it's expensive. 
right? So you have to provision it. If it's just a digital file, like in terms of certificates, usually you need someone to sign off on the certificate. And so you have to involve them. And there's this sort of like enrollment phase uh, where they, they learn who you are and what your key is and you prove that you actually are. So usually you can't just get a certificate because and I could pretend to be you getting your certificate, right? So you have to bootstrap the whole process with um, uh, another process where you actually prove who you are. Then they're like, okay, this is the right key for you. Then you can go ahead and, and use it. So the registration or enrollment thing could be more expensive. It might involve like a cost. Um, and then uh, the, the device portability is the other one that, that probably kills it, which is that uh, I have my certificates on my computer, but now I pick up my phone and I can't log in. So maybe instead of being popular like in the large scale uh, consumer world, maybe it could be more useful in some more governmental application. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. So this is something you see in corporate. It is actually used in corporate use. Um, it could be as simple as even SSHing into a server. Right, so I SSH from my computer to another server, and I have a key on my my server that authenticates me uh, to the other to the other server. So instead of putting a password in, I just type SSH, hit enter, and then boom, it happens, kind of thing. Um, so that's used. It's used in SMIME, which is corporate email, in terms of keys, signing email, uh, client certificates, HTTPS certificates, client side certificates. I think are used. They, anyways, ten years ago they were used more in government. I don't know how much they're used today, but yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah, that, so that's a nice solution. And so that would be classified as two-factor authentication because it's something you know and something you have. It's a little different because usually the thing you have is unique to you and the thing that you know is also unique. In this case, you have a universal thing to have and then a unique. So it's like a custom bespoke like kind of approach, but that's cool, it's interesting. Okay, so uh, anyway, these are the eight alternatives uh, that we came up with. And we sort of talk through maybe some of the trade-offs that are involved in terms of their security and their usability. So next class, what we'll do is we'll, we'll get formal with it. So we'll write down the actual properties where we think that there's differences uh, between these in terms of security, usability, costs, uh, whatever, privacy. Uh, and then we'll try and put it together in an evaluation framework. And then, like I said, I'll show you an, an actual example of what it might look like if you spent three months doing this project instead of uh, spending one lecture doing it. Okay, so uh, that's it. Any final questions? Okay, so I'll see you all next week. Hopefully we'll have the full text set up working.